So, Monty, Doa, thank you so much for joining me, guys. Really appreciate it. It's not very often we get to talk to uh, talent. Um, so today you just did your All-Star Game. You won. Congratulations. Good. Um, as casters, you guys have to be really critical of, of players who are the best of the best. Considering um, this, are there any nerves or anticipation in putting your own skills out there for people to criticize? Not, not in the least, because like nobody, nobody expects us to be good. <laughs> exactly. like, we, we don't have to win <laughs> games for our livelihood. So no, it's just so much fun playing on stage. Because like we're all, I, I think I speak for all of us, we're all competitive gamers, you know, and we all love playing against other people. That's part of like why we love esports. But I think, I think pretty much everybody, maybe with a couple exceptions on the talent team, knows that like their skill on stage and the talent takedown isn't like reflective of like them as a person or something. It's it's purely for fun. And, and uh, it's more fun to win, but like I don't think any of us care if the fans know how good we really are or something, you know. I just really like it because you get to have the same experience that the players do on yeah. stage. So you know, it, it does affect you, right? Because uh, we've only done this a couple of times, and like I do, I never get nervous, even if I'm casting in front of a stadium of twenty thousand people. Uh, but I do get a little bit nervous when these games start. Really? Yeah. So to, to jump right into the uh, the harder hitting stuff here, uh, Monty, you're as as a personality, you're known very well for your hot takes and stuff. In the spirit of that, I'd like to uh, place the target firmly on the, my back as well as my colleagues and get your thoughts in general on the the state of esports journalism. Um, what's the good? What's the bad? What's the ugly? From your your guys' perspectives, I think it's really hard to survive in terms of creating uh, media around esports right now. Uh, because obviously you're so dependent on viewership and sponsorship and like ad rates and stuff like that. Um, and it's, I think it's even harder to, su to survive if you're actually creating like deep dive analytic content because you know, basically we, we look at gaming and then a subsection of that is esports and the subsection of that esport is people who are legitimately interested in the hardcore, like very an analytic aspects of it. So I think it's, I think it's really rough out there and I think that People react really negatively a lot of the time to some of the best journalists that we have in the scenes um, because even if there's some ugliness that comes out as you know as a result of uh, writing an article that reveals something that is necessary to shine a light on, oftentimes fans can take that really badly um, because they they feel like personally attacked by it because it's a game that they follow. And so I think there's a lot of really unnecessary vitriol to, to reporters uh, who are just trying to do their best to expose, you know, things that happen in the scene if you if you are gonna do that kind of work. So I think it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> Do I think that? Uh, not not so much, really. I mean, I've never been a journalist in esports or anything like that. I've written like an article here and there, but it's never really been a focus for me uh, as my career goes. Um, you know, and I think it just it depends on the person, right? I, I, what I don't like to see is uh, people just try to like spur controversy for the sake of clicks, right? Because there are outlets out there that do that, and that irritates me because that takes the dialogue that the fans and the community is having away from necessary conversations that might be serious or might not, and also takes fans away from the ability to just enjoy the game and focus on, you know, the players and the matches and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I don't have a lot to say about it, but my biggest beef is just with the, you know, the, the tabloid esports uh, outlets, as, as it were. As an industry, esports journalism is, is um, pretty pretty amateuristic in, in nature, just a lot of not formally trained people just doing their best effort um, to kind of put out the best content they can. Um, considering this, what do you think needs to change at that level in order to kind of elevate journalistic content and potentially create a better connection between the fans and the content that's being made? I think, honestly, like, what's weird is I think the fan base just needs to get older. Like, uh, the fans are so young right now, and there's a lot of, like, what Doe is talking about, you know, a lot of what happens is outrage culture and stuff like that, and I think that getting older, you tend to take a more nuanced, wise approach to, to issues that occur. And so I think that it will help a lot when, you know, the esports fan base gets into their 30s and 40s and stuff like that. So I think a lot of it is an issue of time. Uh, I also think that universities could be doing better uh, at making sure that there is like a way to train people for esports journalism, you know, just regular sports journalism as well, obviously. Um, and the outlets themselves are, should also be responsible for this. I mean, I've got friends who, many friends who work at ESPN in the esports scene, and they do, ESPN in particular does an excellent job of mentoring people. Um, and I think you see that as 
you know, reporters like Jacob Wolf have developed uh, and honed their craft over a number of years? I think like you totally hit the nail on the head with the university side of things um, in that like universities need to start training journalists from esports perspective and that's something that's just going to take time. Um, my old college just launched their esports uh, uh, program and one of the things that I'm prioritizing with that program um, is that they focus a lot on uh, esports broadcasting. So, because uh, training people to be production people, you know, cameramen, like all the kind of stuff you need in production, but from a gaming perspective, right? Where right now we kind of still have that thing, and this applies to journalism too, I think, where you have a lot of journalists that are really good at journalism and don't know esports, and a lot of esports fans that don't really know good journalism. And it's the same with production too, where you have a lot of good production people that don't know gaming, and a lot of gamers that don't know production. So, as things go th over time and develop, you know, we should be able to. Uh, kind of train people that have both, right? Have that background on both. And I think that's gonna help get rid of a lot of the annoyances that exist now. As your roles working with both Riot and Blizzard change your perception of uh, how esports leagues are run or should be run? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, I think we've, I think we've definitely seen uh, very far ends of the bell curve as far as how well or not well. Uh, a league or a tournament um, might be run in our years of working with different developers and uh, yeah I mean what, what can you say it's it's uh, it's frustrating when you see developers making the same mistakes over and over again but at the same time I think the trajectory has been overall positive and it's just another one of those growing pains things right where it's like these developers have never had to think about you know running a, an esports league before right they're not trained for that this is not something that you expect to ever have to do when you start out you know set out to be a video game maker right so i think i think uh there's an element where you know veterans in the industry need to be listened to maybe a little bit more by the developers here and there but uh it's just kind of one of those developing things that'll keep sort of hopefully growing but yeah, we've certainly seen both sides of it yeah, Dylan and I were consultants for the first two years of the Overwatch League. Mm -hmm. um, so, we, I, at least I feel that they've taken a lot of uh, feedback and like respected our experience in the industry yeah, on a I'll variety of, yeah. of topics. But I think one of the problems is also, you know, to go back to the last question, esports needs to grow up a little bit. And what 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 happens is you bring in people from professional sports who are older, more advanced in their careers, very good at uh, producing, you know, sh either you know shows here in Hollywood or who are on the sports end, and they bring with them a lot of experience. And I think only now are people who are like. OG, like endemic esports people, are starting to be old enough and have enough career experience to like actually start, you know, seriously working on, on shaping the broadcast and shaping the leagues. Because I think beforehand, a lot of us were just too young to really understand it. Oh, yeah. And there, there's sort of this, there was sort of this void in the middle. And I feel like now that a lot of us are, you know, getting into our mid, third, mid, late 30s now, we're starting to be at a point in our careers where, uh, we have enough experience to have insights um, and to start really pushing the direction of broadcast. So, right. yeah. I think to a certain extent, uh, the development of esports kind of parallels the development of like uh, communication technology, where you have so many you know laws being made about the internet and how the internet is you know used and distributed and what can go on what platform, and a lot of it seems like it comes from a very archaic sort of like mindset of what communication is, you know, what a utility is and that kind of stuff too. And a lot of that is because a lot of people making these laws didn't grow up with this stuff, right? They're, they're not used to how to t handle it, right? So when you get into things like uh, bigger esports leagues where you have people at the top that maybe aren't as interested or not interested, aren't as uh, experienced with gaming. And knowledgeable about the Knowledgeable, audience. right. You're going to run into this kind of stuff. and. and you know, again, it's just going to take something. It's going to take our generation getting older and getting into those positions, right? Because we're on camera right now. Eventually, you know, we're probably going to be behind the scenes yeah. working on this kind of stuff. But right now, a lot of the people that kind of know that stuff are in more active, you know, talent or player, you know, roles. So. Or coach roles. Yeah. I think we're, we're starting to sort of bridge the gap of the people who came from the other productions are starting to learn more, like, are learning more about esports and getting better at delivering to the audience. Mm -hmm. And the people who know the audience and know esports very well are growing up. So I feel like we're like bridging the gap both ways right now, which is, it's cool, it's cool. What would you say is the, the biggest misconception among fans about how uh, the logistics of esports kind of work? I mean, every fan out there thinks it's easier to do something than it is. You know, it's, it's <laughs> like, you know, you parallel it to like Game of Thrones right now, you know, people are enjoying it. They're like, why don't they just add three more episodes under the season to fix it? It's like, don't you realize that they filmed all this stuff like a year and a half ago? Like, you can't just go back and do that. So 
I think, you know, and again, this isn't like a criticism to the fan base. It's just something where they don't live in a world that provides them any experience in terms of like how this actually functions, right? So I think that's that's kind of the main thing is is fans just don't realize how long it takes to kind of like accomplish something, like make a change like that. Because yeah, there's some stuff that we wish we could change, you know, with a snap of our fingers too, but you know, it just takes time. There's a lot of hurdles to go through. There's logistical things where sometimes it just might be impossible to make a change for a month or two. Yeah, and it, it, people don't think about the fact that like, you know, budgets are set. Like yeah. there's, there's already a, a the, the whole thing is in motion. So it can be very difficult because even if you want to make a change, it has to go to lawyers. You know, it has to, it's all an entire process of, you know, hundreds of people that changes have to go through. So it's very hard to pivot instantly onto something. And so sometimes it just takes some time. Also, the bigger something gets, the more external rules are enforced on yes. it too. If you want esports to be on television, if you want it to be as big as it can possibly be, there's all these things that didn't impact esports before that do now, like FCC regulations, all this kind of stuff. Like, you know, what can you put on the broadcast? What can't you, what can you say? You know, there's a lot more uh, rules to consider too, and that also slows down the process. So as esports grows, it will be head to, uh, held to a higher amount of restrictions than uh, it was in the past as well. For sure. I'd like to talk to you both for a minute about your, your personal styles and casting and stuff. You you came from uh, the MOBA scene and into an FBS scene, which is very different, very different crowd, very different came game. came from the RTS scene into well. the MOBA scene. <laughs> into the, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> but coming, coming from that more slow-paced, methodical uh, kind of uh, way of casting and way of looking at a game into a, a more fast-paced, you know, high-octane uh, setup like an FPS game, how did you two have to adjust to... Um, this this crowd, this casting style, and this this environment. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a MOBA FPS hybrid. So obviously, and especially now with Go, it's basically is a MOBA and not an it's FPS. Pretty much an FPS MOBA. <laughs> right, I mean, this meta, this meta is the most MOBA it has ever been, or probably will ever be. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think we we made a decision early that we needed what we wanted our style to be was to just slow it down. Um, in general, like yeah. we're not going to talk about all the action that's happening on screen because it just it sort of just hits one note a lot of the time. And we look to like fighting game casters actually a lot for inspiration because they're not calling out every action that's happening on the screen, right? They're trying to pick out the most important thing, and you also have to control the sort of speed of the broadcast by slowing it down in less important moments. Like mm -hmm. if we know that there's going to be an eco push coming in and that this team doesn't have a big chance of winning, then we'll, we'll tend to like joke around or like all have a longer amount of time to talk about the next push and like what the new setup is going to be and do more analysis so in a game that's basically like 100 percent action you can't be as hyped as you were about like a team fight in wall or about a big battle in starcraft 2. you have to have like a, a more measured approach to it because you have to communicate to the audience what action is important because if you just go ballistic and like go super hype with every single fight every single kill you know then the audience uh, has no concept of what is more important than the other unless they're like really really familiar with the game right so where part of the caster's job is to set the tone you know drive the emotion all that kind of stuff you have to be able to bring the levels up and down despite the fact that there are always going to be kills there's always going to be team fights going on not every single one of them is the biggest team fight ever right you got to keep that in mind so when that huge team fight happens then you get to get excited and people know that this is the big moment you know yeah. It's also just, I mean, this game is the hardest game oh, to it's cast. it's insane. Yeah. Period. It's so hard. Like, <laughs> so, it's still an evolving process, right? So. It's fun, but it's really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. Speaking about that evolving process, you know, Doe, my, my first ever esports interview was, was with you before the start of the Overwatch League, out by a pool. I don't know if you right. remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Terrible audio and everything, kids screaming. It was great. But, um, in that conversation, we, we talked about some of the stuff that we was mentioned here, the fighting game uh, kind of element to, to the casting style. How has that developed over time with the inclusion of things like the new spectator client and just, you know, kind of learning this stuff as you go over the course of what's a year and a half now or almost almost two years? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is like the, the improvements of the spectator client have helped a lot. Um, we've got a top down view now that Monty mostly looks at that, gives a lot more data as far as like status effects that are That's hitting like people and all key. that. It's so <laughs> important, right? <laughs> and I think the the constant thing, uh, especially for me as play by play, is just keep reminding myself to slow it down. You know, you just gotta keep slowing it down because as a play by play guy, especially coming from something like League of Legends, you really want to like talk about all the action, but you can't. It's, it's impossible, and you shouldn't. You know. So it's it's constantly like all right, you slow it down. Now slow it down more. You know now 
now like distill this even more and find out what the you know ultra important moments are and kind of free up more of that time you know i mean people talked about like the modern doa podcast right the league of legends games and all that and we obviously don't have anywhere near as much time to do something like that in overwatch but the more we slow it down and the more we sort of like crystallize as far as what moments are the vital ones to hit that opens up a little bit more space to kind of bring the personalities out and have a little bit more fun with it and uh yeah so i think uh you know, over time, it's it's. I think it's gone pretty well. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a good time. Yeah. So it's uh, it's also like it depends yeah. on the stakes of the match, right? Like, right. We right. we will go in. I mean, it's going to be a garbage game that nobody right. cares about. Like, we have to be entertaining if the game isn't. So we'll joke around a lot more. You know, it, <laughs> nothing's worse than bad teams. Mayhem justice match. games yeah. this season are not going to get a lot of serious casting from us. Like. We're just gonna make jokes, mm -hmm. and that's how it's gonna be. Like, sorry, Mayhem and Justice fans, but uh, <laughs> and we're, then, not, we're not gonna pretend something inter is interesting that it's not. And likewise, like, if it's a stage playoff match, we're gonna be much more dialed in on the game and much more hype. And like, you know, I, you can see there's a difference because I think in any game you come into, the stakes have to matter, right? Mm -hmm. So otherwise, it's just sort of like lying to the audience in a way. And they'll know, too. Like, the audience will know if you're overhyping something, right? So you, you shouldn't do that, first of all. But if you choose to, then the audience will immediately see that you're being fake, right? And they're gonna like that even less, you know? And, uh, I mean, it, the thing is, too, this isn't even something that applies to only esports. This is something you'd see in any sport you watch on television, is that if, if you're watching a football game that's a total blowout, they're not gonna be, like, intricately picking apart every play. They're gonna be talking about, like, some other game that's more important, you know, next week. Or they're gonna be talking about like, oh, remember when this great player played for this team and, like, he used to get stats like this, you know, they're they're going to kind of, like, not treat that as seriously, uh, too, you know? So, if the game isn't entertaining, the commentators have to be. Fair enough. Last question, guys. Um, so, this year we have the GOATS meta, which is a pretty big and dramatic change up to the formula that we came to know and love. Did that also, in part, like, change the formula of how to cast for it? Or, or was it kind of a natural progression considering the more MOBA aspects you were mentioning earlier? I mean, I think it's better for us. Like. I think it made it, it made it easier and harder at the same yeah. time. Um, I think it made it easier in that the action is more condensed. You don't have a lot of, like, uh, outlying uh, action going around around the tertiary. It's more just like the fight happens in here, in the grav, basically, you know? But at the same time, it makes it harder because the subtlety and the good plays in the game right now in this meta are a lot harder to see clearly. It's easy to see when a Widowmaker hits a headshot. It's a lot harder to see when this, you know, D.Va turned at just the right moment to eat a grab, or the Reinhardt, like, got his shield in just the right position, you know, or he got, like, one swing around a corner that unlocked his Earth Shatter or something, right? So it's tougher to sort of, like, bring that excitement across because it's much more subtle in this meta. Yeah, I think it's easier to spectate, but harder to watch, if that makes <laughs> sense. Like, the free cam, and, and you can contain all the action in a, in a single shot, which is unusual by our historical Overwatch standards. But, like Doa was saying, the subtlety... I mean, I like GOATs because I like MOBAs, and so, you know, having... It's basically a MOBA team fight, and having the subtlety built into who's using cooldowns, you know, I, I'm keeping track of bubbles and like Brigitte armor packs while the, the fight's going on, which is exactly what the pro players are doing, right? Um, because those things make a huge difference. But it is extremely difficult to notice everything that goes into a ghost fight because there's just so much happening at the same time. Um, I, I would like if Goats wasn't the dominant meta. I would like it still to be viable because I think it's interesting and it's a cool comp. Yeah, it's cool. Like it's it's not Goats isn't really the problem. The problem is that it's only Goats. Yes, that you know? I agree. That's, yeah. that's <laughs> Goats is a cool comp, and it'd be cool if it was only used in certain maps and certain situations. But right now it's kind of everywhere, so we'll do it. Yeah, fair enough, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.